Greetings. This is Prophet Tom from Australia once again. What a joy it is to come together on our Tuesday nights and look at the names of God. We are going to look at a name today that is so powerful. And uh, my desire, my hope, my prayer is that you can be part of this today and share your revelations of Jehovah. Uh, and also, not only that, but you can pass this on. This is a message, I believe, that every believer needs to have a fresh revelation on. And so our topic today is we're looking at the names of God. This is Prophet Tom James. And today we're looking at Jehovah, means Lord, Master, the Omnipotent One. But the name that I like within this title, and I've given it today, is the power in his hand. Now, as we lead into the illustrations that I have for us today, uh, let's, first of all, let us pray. Father, you are the great I am. Wow. Just the thought of that, almighty God. You are the great I am. Nothing can stand in your way. Nothing can put an obstacle across the path that you would have us walk down. Lord, all seemed to be against Moses, but nothing could stand in his way because you said, I am, goes before you. You are the great I am, almighty God. Uh, whatever comes before us, whatever tries to stop us, the great I am will take us through every obstacle, every situation. Now I know from everyone that is watching us today and everyone that will watch this video clip in the days ahead are facing obstacles. But let me reassure you and let this word today reassure you that nothing, absolutely nothing, can stand in the way of Jehovah, the Omnipotent One. And so today we open this subject up, and I'm sure we won't get through it, but we're going to open it today and see where God uh, is going to take us and the revelation that he has for us. Now, I want to start off by establishing a powerful truth. I know we all know it, but I want to establish this truth. But before I do that, I mentioned briefly right at the outset, I want you to be involved today. Now we're looking at Jehovah, the omnipotent one, or as I said, the power in his hand. So as I'm sharing the truths and the revelation that God has given to me today, any in this line that God has given to you, type it on the side as you make comments. You know, say you are facing cancer and uh, Jehovah, the omnipotent one, came and, and delivered you of cancer. That happened to me 22 years, 23 years ago. And so if that happened to you, if you know where the omnipotent one has stepped in and cleared the path so that you can go through, make that comments on the side. And I, that would be great because then we're all part of this discussion today. So let us open our Bibles to Genesis and chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, we see a powerful, powerful truth. And that truth is that, that God created man to love him and to have fellowship with him. We've looked at it in the past that, you know, God created everything. But when it came to man, he personally got down in the sand and created us. And, and, and every day, and to us today, every moment, in fact, he lives inside of us. But every day, God would go into the garden. He would walk and talk with Adam and Eve. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And uh, let's start with verse 8. But we're going to come back to it in a moment. So in verse 8, it says, Then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So here is God in the cool of the day. In the afternoon time, God says, I can't wait to go and see. Adam and Eve. And you know, God is saying today, I can't wait for Tuesday when Prophet Tom goes on Facebook 
and he begins to share the revelation of Jehovah. And he says, I can't wait for that because I will come down and I will walk amongst uh, uh, Tom as he shares. I will walk amongst David. I will walk uh, amongst Abby. I will walk amongst uh, uh, everyone that is watching this today. And so we have the assurance as you're listening today that Jehovah, the omnipotent one, Jehovah, the power in his hand is with us and walking amongst us today. Now, we're going to come back to that, but let us quickly go over to Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16, and it says these words. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you. Wow. You see, God has raised us up today, you and me. You know, why am I on Facebook? Because God has raised us up. God has given us a gift. God has empowered us. Uh, you know, he says, and we may look at this later, but he says in, in, chap in John chapter 14, he says that the, the works that I did, you will do greater works than these. He says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, he says that uh, when the Holy Ghost comes, you shall be empowered. He's empowered us. And that's what he's saying here. He says that I may show my power in you. Now let's go over to uh, verse 27 for a moment of that same chapter. And it says here, and Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. You see, when we live with Jehovah living inside of us, when we live with the omnipotent presence, presence of God in us and flowing out of us, the world must see their sin and must repent. Even though in our chapter there, as we may look at later, uh, he relented and went back to sinning. But you see, we make a difference. I can give you thousands of illustrations, even within my own life uh, of, uh, of people that were bikies that would go in my car with me years ago when I would take when we go to work. And, 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 you know, this particular guy that I'm thinking of right now, he was like 300 pounds uh, in chains all over him, tattoos all over him. But in my car, he would weep and weep as we talked about his relationship, as we talked about uh, him and God. He would weep within my car because the convicting power of God uh, will bring repentance within their heart. And so let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 7, and it says this. <clears throat> Then the eyes of both of them were open. Now we know that they just sinned. I want to bring a little truth here in a moment. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. You know, when we sin, we try to cover it up. Who took the piece of bread when you were a child? Who, who pinched the cake? Not me. Not me. It was my brother. It was my sister. Even as a child, we try to cover up our sins. And here is Adam and Eve. You know, I believe, I could be totally wrong, but I believe that if they had not hidden, if they had not sown fig leaves, if they were not ashamed of what they'd done, that they ran to God on that day and fell on their face before God, I'm sure that God would have found a way around and not thrown them out of the Garden of Eden. You see, don't cover your sins up. Don't make something small become a mountain. That's our problem. You know, we make one little mistake and it builds 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 and it, builds and it gets to the point that it's out of control. Uh, we, we've had articles in the paper and on the news here that of people that were accountants or 
in the financial departments of large companies and they began to take money from that company because of their gambling habits. And, and when they were finally caught, they had taken millions because they wouldn't acknowledge their, 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 their shortcomings. They wouldn't acknowledge their sin. They wouldn't have it dealt with. We need to deal with it. Adam and Eve needed to deal with it. They covered it up and we try to cover it up. We get fig leaves. You know, fig leaves cannot be sewn together. Fig leaves ultimately die. You may pick it from a tree, but ultimately die and expose your sin. And we will see this in a moment when we go into Egypt. But uh, here we see that they came before, well, 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 God began to walk in the garden uh, and their eyes of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering and they heard the sound. You know, this was not, this is like thunder, rah, boom, 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 walking in the garden. God knew what they had done. And he even gives them a chance here. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You know, it's amazing when we sin. It's amazing when guilt sets in and we come under the bondage of what we have done wrong. One of the first things we stop doing is going into the presence of God. One of the first things we stop doing is going to church. We stop reading our Bible. We stop praying. The enemy gets in and claws us totally. And here we see this with Adam and Eve. And the Lord heard the sound. Of, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of God amongst the trees in the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam. Now that's important. You see, God's calling to us now. Doesn't matter what we've done wrong. Doesn't matter what sin we've done wrong. You may have been on the computer watching pornographic uh, uh, video clips or videos. Uh, you know, you may have been out and got drunk at the pub. Uh, you may have uh, been out and slept with another woman. You may have done unbelievable sins. But God wants you to come to him. God wants you to fall on your face before him. I don't know, but I wonder what would have happened if Adam and Eve had ran to him and fallen on their face. But, you know, God didn't come to them. Reminds me of the boat when Jesus said the disciples, go out and get into the boat and row across the other side while I send the crowd away uh, in, in Mark chapter 5. Uh, and it says that when Jesus walked on the water, it says he would have walked past them. But they had to invite him in. We've got to invite him in. If we're going through a trial, if we're going through challenges, uh, if the enemy is throwing everything he's got at us, we got to invite Jehovah, the power in his hand. We've got to invite Jehovah into our boat, into our circumstances, into the environment that we're going through. You see, we can't get through this storm on our own. You know, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, you can't get through that storm on your own. If you've been in, uh, if the doctor has said to you uh, that, that, you know, you have six months to live, uh, you can't get through that on your own. That's a storm you're going through. Uh, but, you know, Mark chapter 5 and, 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 um, and, and, and John chapter 6 and verse 21 says in the same story, it says that when Jesus got into the boat, the storm stopped. Then John 6, 21 says, and immediately they were on the other side. You see, if whatever storm we're going through, we can't do it on our own, friends. We've got to invite Jehovah, the omnipotent one, into our storm, into our boat, into our environment. And so we read on. And the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman. See, God didn't ask him, where did it come from? God said to Adam, have you? God's saying to Tom James, have you? Man up. 
There's a group here in Australia called Man Up. We need to man up. We need to acknowledge our failures. Don't put it on someone else. Well, you know, this wouldn't have happened if that happened. No, no, no. A mistake was made. A sin was committed. Man up. And God is there for us. So let's now go to Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, we read the story. Well, in Exodus 2, we read the story where Israel cried out to God and God heard their cry. And then God was planning and developing Moses to be their deliverer. And so God comes to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, we read these words. Then Moses, let me go from verse 12, in fact. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have given you when you have, uh, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve the God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers hath sent me to you, and they, uh, and they will say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am have sent you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is the memorial to all generation. Moses said, you know, Israel won't believe me. You know, to Moses, the greatest challenge was not Satan. To Moses, the greatest challenge was not Pharaoh. To Moses, the greatest challenge was the church. To Moses, the greatest challenge was Israel. How is he going to get them on his side? And you know, today, the greatest challenge to an unfire believer is not Satan. The greatest challenge to an unfire believer is the church. How are we going to win the church over? There's nothing that Tom James can do to win the church of Jesus Christ. But there's a lot I am can do. And so we've got to say, I am has sent me. Now, that's just words. So what does God mean here? When God says, tell them I am, I am, has sent me, what is he saying? He's saying live it. You see, we've got to get out of our box church. We've got to get out of the environment, the, the, the regulations, you know, the, the circumstances that, that are around us. The, 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 the environment we grew up in, well, this is the way it's done. No, 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 no. God does it differently. We've got to get out of that. What is God saying? What is God saying here when he says, I am? He is saying this, the power in his hand. We're going to look at illustrations today, and I'm sure next week uh, we're going to look at illustrations today of what God was saying um, and saying to Moses here. He wasn't saying words, church. Listen to this. He wasn't saying, go up to the unbeliever in the street and say, I am has sent me. They'll just spit in your face. They'll laugh at you. They'll mock you. But go up to them and say, hey, God's just shown me that you've just been diagnosed with cancer. Hey, God's just shown me that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're not married and you're fallen pregnant and you're too scared to tell your parents. Have words of knowledge. Have prophetic words. Let I am speak before you. Go up to people that are in wheelchairs in the streets. Go up to people that are on crutches in the streets and speak the power of God over them. God, the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one in your hand, in your body. The word of God tells Tom James. The word of God tells us that God lives within us. I don't have time to go into that. God lives within us. And so that means within us there is the power in his hand, is the power within his hand. We've got a choice to make, to be here or to be there. 
We can stay in a religious rut. We can stay within the church environment. We can stay within the four walls. Or we can risk everything and go outside the four walls. Moses was happy in the desert. Moses had a family. Moses had the sheep. Moses had no hassles. And, and, you know, even when we look at the nation of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, every day God supplied water. Every day God supplied food. Every day there were miracles all around them. But the day they crossed over the Jordan and went in to possess the promised land, and that day they went into war. They had to step over. They had to move from here to there. But when they moved to there, it meant battle. It meant putting on the armor of God. It meant ready to advance. You say, well, I don't want that. Well, you can stay in the wilderness and die and miss out on everything because that's what happened to Israel. So we've got a choice to do. And here is Moses and God meets him at the burning bush. And God said, I've got an assignment for you. And we know the story so well. Moses tries to find every excuse that he can. Moses comes up with every reason why he shouldn't have to do this. But listen to this. When Moses goes from here to there, God begins to be, reveal some powerful truths. Let's go to Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. In Exodus chapter 7, and verse 1, we read these words. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your, your brother, shall be your prophet. Listen. Let me read it again. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as Elohim. Moses was given an assignment. He was the ambassador for God to go to Egypt. <clears throat> and as he's preparing for this encounter, he's now in Egypt. And so as he's preparing for this, a powerful revelation comes out. And that revelation is God says to Noah, uh, Mo, uh, Moses, God says to Moses, Moses, you are Elohim to Pharaoh. Tom James, you are Elohim, like Elohim. You say, how can you say that? How can you say that? You know, that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees said about Jesus. How can you say you're the son of God? How can you say that you're going to heaven? How can you say these things? Well, the word of God says we can. And here God said to Moses, I have made you as Elohim to Pharaoh. You are, as it were, literally God standing before Pharaoh. You know, here's the, the, the challenge before you. It may be cancer. It may be diabetes. Uh, it may be asthma. It may be some other disease. Your, your kidneys may be uh, diseased. Uh, your liver may be full of, uh, uh, of cancer and may be destroyed because of your past life. Uh, and God is saying to you, look at that cancer. Look at that tumor. Look at that uh, kidney disease. Uh, look at that diabetes. Look at that uh, uh, challenge that you're going through. And you are, as it were, a lohem. You are Jehovah the omnipotent one. Speak to that cancer. Speak to that diabetes. Speak to that liver disease. Speak to that kidney failure. Speak to that skin disease. Speak to that work situation. Speak to that family situation. Speak to that uh, environment that you're finding yourself in. Uh, speak to those drugs that are, uh, have controlled your body. Uh, speak to those things uh, because you are, as it were, Elohim standing before it. Uh, and so Moses, it says in verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show me a miracle. You see, this is where the church is failing today. This is where we're failing. You know, years ago, or not years ago, just two years ago, I was in uh, Bengoma in Kenya, 
and I was preaching at this church. We did uh, four or five nights of meetings, packed the place out. And on the Friday morning, in the Friday morning service, a woman booked herself out of hospital with stage five cancer or stage four, stage four cancer. And she bought the x-ray. She was given just months to live, but she booked herself out of that hospital, got a taxi, came to our meeting, and I'm standing before that woman. That's the bottle, if you like, is the woman. I'm standing before that woman. And I said, what do you need prayer for? And she showed me the x-rays and her body is riddled with cancer. And she said, they've given me just months to live. You can watch this on my YouTube channel. I have it there. And we prayed for that woman. It was like I was Elohim standing before that woman. It was like I was Elohim standing before that cancer. I spoke to that cancer. I commanded that cancer to come out. That woman began to cry out, all pain's gone. I, can, I have no more pain. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. And so I got the pastor's wife out. And I said, take this woman around the building. And they went around the building. It was like they were gone forever. And then they, they came back into the church. And I said, how do you feel? Now, she could hardly walk when she came into that meeting on that day. And she had walked and ran around this building. And she came down in front of me. And she says, I have no pain. I am healed. Hallelujah. This is what God is looking for. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, when Pharaoh speaks to you, say, show a miracle for yourselves. Then you shall say, Aaron, take your rod and cast it before, her, before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh uh, and they did so just as the Lord had commanded that. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servant, servant, uh, servants and it became a serpent. Here is the miracle power of God. But listen, the devil's no fool. <clears throat> the devil's no fool. And so we read. But Pharaoh also called his wise men, his sorcerers, his musicians of Egypt, and they also did like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's, listen, but Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods of these men, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. You see, Satan will have a counter reaction to everything you do. And, you know, one of the sad realities today is that we will go to meetings and we will pray for people and God will heal them. And then the next day, the sickness is upon them because they've fallen for the deception of the enemy. We need to take our victory. And then we need to make sure that that victory stays within us. It says here that Satan's uh, uh, men, that, that Pharaoh's men threw down their rods and their rods became snakes. Listen. Aaron's rod ate up all those snakes. They could not stand in the presence of Jehovah, the omnipotent one. They could not stand in the presence of the hand, the power of the hand. They could not stand in the presence of God. We need to make sure we are in the presence of God. We need to make sure we have the rod of God. We need to carry the rod around with us. We need to say, when God says, throw the rod down, we need to throw it down and see the power of God become reality, become life-changing. Even though, now listen, this is important because we've only just started this. We're going to continue it next week, but this is important. When we go out and we preach the gospel, the immediate reaction may be totally negative to what you think you're going to have. That's not the time to stop. That's not the time to stop. We'll see this here next week. Time and time and time again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart, ten times his heart was hardened. God said, go to Pharaoh. Say this. Say this. So let's look at the first plague. 
a little, and then we'll pick it up again next week. So in chapter 7 and verse 14, it says this. Now, this is the plague. In fact, let me um, read out the, 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 excuse me, my papers are stuck together. Let me read out the plagues for you. The first plague was water turned to blood. The second plague was frogs. The third was lice. The fourth was flies. The fifth was livestock disease. The sixth was boil. The seventh was hail. The eighth was locust. The ninth was darkness. The tenth was death. So let's just for a few moments look at the first one. And so let's go uh, to Exodus 7 and verse 14. In Exodus 7 and verse 14, it says this. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes up to the water and you shall stand by the river bank to meet him and the rod which was turned to a serpent, uh, you shall take it in your hand and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the rivers with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. Uh, let me just read on a couple of more verses. And the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink. And the Egyptians shall loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, over all the pools of water, that uh, they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all of the land of Egypt both in the buckets, in, in the wood, in the pitches of stone, everywhere. Moses and Aaron did that. Now listen, as we finish today, this is so important. First thing we see here today is the power of God. I've been to Egypt. I've been in a boat down the Nile River. It's a huge river. It's wide. It's long. On that day, that blue water turned to blood. The ponds, the rivers, the creeks, even the water in the trees and the buckets turned to blood. You see, you can't fight the power of God doesn't matter what your attitude is. It doesn't matter where you stand. It doesn't matter what authority you got. You know, I believe the first curse that God brought upon the Egyptians was to show the Egyptians and was to show Pharaoh, you kill my babies. You mingle their blood in the rivers. You mingle their blood in the land. You mingle their blood everywhere. You kill thousands of my ba babies. It was like God has seen to our nations today. You've killed my babies. I'm turning your water into blood. Many places, Australia has experienced some of the most severe droughts that they've had in hundreds of years. We kill their babies. We've killed the babies of God. But this shows you the omnipotent power of God. Here is the hand of God, the power of God. He says to Moses, stretch out your rod. Let me get my rod again. Stretch out your rod. Go over the river Nile. Stretch it out over the river Nile. Go over the, ridge, the ponds. Stretch it out. And as they stretch their hand out of Egypt, all of the waters turned to blood. But let me tell you one thing as we close. The rivers the creeks, the ponds, the buckets in Goshen, where Israel lived, were pure, were pure. There was no blood on the hands of Israel. The blood was on the hands of Satan. 
And the first thing that God is telling us today, when we go out as generals in the army of God, when we go out as ambassadors of God, we go before Satan and we say, Satan, let my people go. And then we stretch forth the rod and his rivers and his rivers turn to blood. Now we looked last Thursday and you need to look at that tape. We looked last Thursday when we looked at, um, at the seven statements of Christ on the cross, we looked at the living water, that Christ is the living water. That's the contrast. We have the sour water from Satan, the water that can't be touched. Now listen to this. If you go around sinners, they stink. If you go around sinners, there's something about them. You know, I heard a preacher say uh, on, on YouTube that I was listening to last night. He said, you know, he said, when I got saved, he said, I had nowhere to go but church. He said, I didn't necessarily want to be in church, but he said, I knew I couldn't go with my friends anymore because I couldn't be in that environment anymore. And he said, I didn't want to watch many of the shows on TV because they weren't the shows that I should be watching. He said, I didn't know what to do. I was a brand new Christian, so I just went to church. And then the living water began to flow through him. But you know, it says here in this reading, it said the, 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 the fish died. There was stench throughout the land. It says, you know, they, wouldn't have been, they couldn't drink the water. They wouldn't be able to bathe in the water. And so even themselves stunk because they couldn't bathe or shower. And then, you know, the last thing it says, and this is interesting when you think of John chapter 10 and verse 10, it says that Satan is out to kill, destroy, and steal. And, you know, it tells us, research has told us that man can only go eight or nine days without water. Here, their water supply has been turned off. See, the enemy is destroyed, church. Just hang in there, church. That cancer around your body, it's destroyed. God's turned the source off. Oh, it may not go away today. It may be eight days. It says, read that passage there in Channel 7. Our time's gone. We don't have time. You know, the liver disease in your body, the son or the daughter that's ran away and you don't know where they're at. God's turned the source off of the enemy. Whatever you're going through right now, if you're going through financial hassles, God's turned the source off from the enemy. It says later, and we'll look at this in the days ahead. It says when Israel left Egypt, that they took the wealth of Egypt with them. God's turned the source off Egypt. It's quite an amazing thing that Goshen, Israel, had pure water, but the Egyptians didn't go there. They drowned and died in their bloody water. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this powerful word. My life's been changed because of it. Father, I pray that everyone that has listened to this message will be challenged and will come to an understanding, even though we've just started this truth, will come to the understanding that Jehovah is omnipotent and that Jehovah lives within us and his hand of power flows out of us and the enemy cannot stand before us. Amen. Amen. Well, what a joy it's been to be with you today. Uh, I pray that you've enjoyed this message. Share it with your friends. And uh, on Thursday night, we'll be looking at the seven last statements of Christ. So come and join with us on Thursday night. Thursday afternoon and have a great week what's left of it this is prophet Tom James from Australia greeting you with his love and saying God bless and have a great week amen